respond to the gospel accordingly as our lives would see fit. We thank you so much for all that you've done. We give you praise and worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, Hopewell. It's great to see you this morning. Man, we are a privileged people here today. We serve a risen Savior. Amen? And He gives us the victory, not because of who we are or what we do, but because of who He is and what's been done for us. And I'm so thankful for the grace and mercy of God. I'm thankful that Jesus not only saves us, He indwells us with the power of His Holy Spirit to help us, to guide us through this life, to flood our hearts with hope and peace and joy and love. And so I hope you sense that this morning. I hope that you sense the presence of the Lord, the manifest presence of God in this place. And uh, man, there's a lot going on here at Hopewell. We've got BBS coming tonight. We're going into the Outback. This is an outstanding set. And uh, I'm telling you, our ministry team here at Hopewell has done an outstanding job. Not only have they decorated for VBS, but they've had to flex and bend with the renovations that are going on. And, and so I'm just so proud of them, and they are working so hard. So anytime you see somebody on staff here at Hopewell, just say, hey, I appreciate you because I've been doing that all week long. And we're just anticipating this place to be packed with kids tonight uh, that need to hear the gospel. And so we're going to love on them, and we're going to share Jesus with them, and we pray that we see many of them I trust in the Lord for their salvation. Uh, the painting is essentially done upstairs and downstairs. Isn't that great? Yeah. And so we're holding off on the flooring until after VBS. We want to give them an opportunity to spill stuff on the old carpet and all of that one last time. And then we'll rip it all up and we'll, we'll put some new flooring in. So be in prayer for that. Renovations are going smoothly. And all, all the contractors are just doing an exceptional job. Red Letter Painting, they're great guys, and uh, they're just doing a great job. And the flooring guys come in next week. And so we got to see a, a little bit of change going on around here, and I'm really excited for that. And so praise God for his provision. Uh, yeah, we're, we're having hats are for sale. So guys, Father's Day's coming, and you could, you could pick your hat out this morning. You will not be able to walk out with a hat. We're going to take your money first. Then we're going to order the hat, and your hat will be here in about three to four weeks, okay? So I just wanted to bring some clarity on that. But uh, represent our church, and we didn't put anything that says Hopewell on it. It's just the logo, the well, that means grounded, growing, and going. And so when people say, what's that mean? You have to be ready to tell them about your church and what it means, okay? I will turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 13. Last week, I started a series entitled Fathers of the Faith, which will lead us up through Father's Day. And last week we looked at a fearful father whose name was Jairus. And Jairus was facing a situation that was outside of his control. His 12-year-old daughter, his only child, was facing death. And he was desperate. He didn't know what to do. And so he went to Jesus. And he did the wisest thing any father could do. He invited Jesus into his home and introduced Jesus to his family. And I challenged those of you who are dads to do the same last week because Jesus can do everything you can't do, Jesus can be everything you can't be as a father. And Jairus learned that lesson. He brought Jesus home to his family. Well, today we're going to look at another famous father of the faith. His name is David. King David is a popular personality from God's word because of the different ways that God used David and worked through David. You remember David, the shepherd boy, right? Uh, when I was a little kid, I loved hearing stories about David because that's my name. The David, David means beloved of God. And so I had an affinity with David, our missionary that just shared, our missionary to the UK, his name's David. And so we have this affinity with stories about David. And I, I love hearing stories about David as a shepherd boy, how he defended his flock of sheep against a lion and a bear. And my favorite story of all time was when he faced the giant named Goliath. He was nine foot, six inches tall, and David went out with a sling uh, do you remember in children's church back in the day, we had this little song, only a boy named David, only a little sling, right? Do you remember that? Only a boy named David, but he could pray and sing. Am I alone in that? Do you guys, was that a Pentecostal song? <laughs> Did we just sing it in Pentecostal church? Okay. Great song. We'd sing that song about uh, David, uh, and, and one little stone went in the sling, and the sling went around and around. One little stone went in the sling, and the sling went around and around. And around and around and around and around and around and around and around. One little stone went through the air, smack, and the giant came tumbling down. Okay? 
And then David ran over and got Goliath's sword, and then he cut off Goliath's head. No, that wasn't in the song, okay? That's what happened. But we didn't sing about that in the song. Anyway, David, there's so many cool stories about David. David was a warrior. David was a poet. David was a songwriter. He was a singer. He played instruments. David was a leader. He was a dynamic personality in the Bible. After he slew Goliath, we knew that King Saul invited David into his palace so that he could sing and play songs for Saul, who had a troubled soul, and it would calm Saul down. But Saul was a little crazy, and he tried to pin David to the wall with a spear a couple times. And so David was on the run because Saul was trying to kill him because Samuel had anointed David to become king and to replace him. And so David ran and hid in caves. And then, and then just a a bunch of different guys came and gathered around him, and they became David's mighty men. He had 300 men. There were skilled warriors that would do anything for David, and then eventually Saul dies, and David takes to the throne and becomes Israel's greatest king. God used David to expand Israel's territory, to build up the city of Jerusalem. But there were a few faults that David had, and David was a faulty father. And so while I would love to highlight just the great, awesome things that God used David to do in Israel, today we're going to look at a not-so-famous side of David. And so I've had you turn in your Bibles to Acts 13, because in this passage of Scripture, God makes an amazing statement about this man named David. Let's stand together, and we'll read Acts chapter 13, verses 22 and 23. God's word says, and when he, God, had removed him, Saul, he raised up for them, Israel, David, as king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, this is God, speaking of David, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. From this man's seed, according to the promise, God raised up for Israel a savior, Jesus. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you don't just record the highlights for us. You record everything. We get to see the full picture of a man named David. And this morning, as we look at what kind of a father David was, and we study some of his faults, Lord, remind us of your grace, remind us of your mercy, and remind us that ultimately all of us stand in great need of both. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Today, in various passages of Scripture, we're going to see that David was a faulty father. There's four, four revelations about that. And the first is his songs. His songs. David is the author of many psalms, and psalms are essentially songs that are to be accompanied by stringed instruments. And he wrote psalms. In fact, 2 Samuel 23.1 calls David the sweet psalmist of Israel. David could have said of himself, I write the Psalms that make all Israel sing, right? I write the Psalms of love and special things. Anyway, he wrote the Psalms that made the young girls cry. But he wrote the Psalms. And he wrote all kinds of Psalms. He, he, wrote, he wrote various psalms, and they were, they were songs that captured his emotions, that showed the full range, the full spectrum of human emotions in David's life. You see, David, while a great man that God used, was just a man. And when a person sings, especially when a person writes songs, you get to see not just their intellect, you get to see their emotion. It's filled with their heart, their feelings, their Emotion, And because we have so many psalms from David, we get to learn so much about him as we read through them. David's life and music were filled with a full range of human emotions. Inspired by the Spirit of God, yes, but through the instrument of a mere man, and his name was David. He wrote songs of praise, and I'm giving you some examples there. Underneath your first point there, song of praise, Psalm 8, for example. O Lord, O Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who have set your glory above the heavens. Psalm 40, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He also brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet on a rock, and he established my steps. He has put a new song in my mouth, David said. Praise to our God. 
Many will see it in fear and trust in the Lord. Psalm 98, he says, shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth in song, rejoice and sing praises. Sing to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the sound of the psalm, with trumpets and the sound of the horn. Shout joyfully before the Lord, the King. On and on, I could read you songs of praise that David wrote, just inspiring people to join him in worship. But he also wrote songs of pain, songs of pain. He was just a man, and he went through some dark valleys that led him to write things like Psalm 6. I am weary with my groaning. All night I make my bed swim with sweat. I drench my couch with tears. My eyes waste away because of grief. It grows old because of all my enemies. Psalm 38, he wrote, O Lord, do not rebuke me in your wrath, nor chasten me in your hot displeasure, for your arrows pierce me deeply, and your hand presses me down. He was a man who experienced pain. He says, my iniquities have gone over my head like a heavy burden. They're too heavy for me, God. My wounds are foul and festering because of my foolishness. As you read through David's Psalms, you see a man who is laid bare with the pain of life. He also wrote songs of poetry. One of my favorite Psalms is Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment. Nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous, for the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Psalm 23 is so poetic. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So poetic. We see psalms of praise, psalms of pain, psalms of poetry, psalms of prayer. Psalm 63 says, you God are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you. I remember meeting with a a young man who had just gotten saved, and he said, Dave, I don't really know how to pray. I can't pray like brother so-and-so when he stands and prays in church. I can't. I can't. I'm not good with words. How do I pray? I said, read the Psalms. Reading the Psalms will teach you how to pray because in those Psalms, David just bears his heart and soul in a very transparent way. He talks to God. And that's how we talk to God. We just are real and we bear our soul. He writes songs of prayer. He writes songs of prophecy. God prophesied through David about the Savior of the world. David, thousands of years before Jesus hung on the cross, wrote the words inspired by the Holy Spirit that Jesus would say from the cross. God used David in a mighty way. But David was just a man. And the Psalms reveal that to us. He had highs. He had lows. He had faith. He had doubt. He had righteous moments and he had sinful moments. And so we learn a lot about this faulty father through his songs. But we also, unfortunately, learn a lot about this faulty father through, number two, his sins. His sins. And some are more famous than others. You remember the story? That while David's armies were at war one spring, David remained home. Everything was going well in David's life. His kingdom was established. He was having victory over his enemies. And so he stayed behind. They don't need me out there on the front lines. And so he was just casually hanging out. And from his rooftop, he sees a beautiful woman bathing. What was her name, church? Bathsheba. The wife of Uriah the Hittite, who was one of David's mighty men. Uriah was at war, fighting for David, and David was on his roof, eyeballing Uriah's wife. 
David calls for Bathsheba. He sleeps with her. She becomes pregnant. David calls Uriah back from battle, hoping to cover up his tracks and to cover his sin, hoping that Uriah would be with his wife and believe the child to be his. But Uriah, who was faithful to David, refused to go home and be comforted by his wife while his brethren were out on the battlefield. What a good man. David even tries to get Uriah drunk to trick him into going home. He doesn't fall for it because he has at this moment more character than David. And so then David, blinded by his sin, trying to cover up his tracks, orders the commander of his army to push forward in battle and then withdraw and leave Uriah there to die. And it works. Uriah is killed in battle. David brings Bathsheba into the palace and makes her his wife. This incident in David's life shows us that everyone, listen to me, everyone, even people we highly esteem, struggle with sin. Everyone. Even the best of men are men at best. David was just a man. It also serves as a cautionary tale about temptation and the way that sin can so quickly multiply. The old saying, sin will take you farther than you wanted to go. It will keep you longer than you wanted to stay. And it will make you pay more than you ever wanted to pay. Sin always leads to suffering. And David's sin led to great suffering. Not just for Uriah, not just for Bathsheba, but for David himself and his family for multiple generations. You know, I wonder if David would have still called for Bathsheba if he could have seen the subsequent death of a son, the decimation of his kingdom. I wonder if he would have still gone through with that. Because sin thrills, then it kills. It fascinates, then it assassinates. It entices, then it dices. Satan has some sort of Sheba out there for every one of us. She may not be taking a bath on a rooftop nearby. She might not be a bath, Sheba. (laughs) But she might be at work. She might be at school. She might be on a screen close by. The Hebrew name Bathsheba means daughter of the oath. The first part, bath, means daughter. Sheba means the oath. And so there's a Sheba out there that will test your oath. There is. And in that moment, our loyalty to the Lord and our loyalty to our loved ones must win the day. We are not commanded to stand and fight youthful lust. We are commanded to flee youthful lust. 2 Timothy 2, 22. David should have gone inside. Look the other way. King David's bedtime with Bathsheba was not the only sin he committed. But there are particularly destructive consequences associated with sexual sin because of its intimate nature. It's not just physically destructive. It is emotionally and psychologically destructive. And we know how David's sin affected Uriah. Uriah died. He did nothing. But he died in battle because of David's sin, another man's sin. Think of how it affected Bathsheba. You know, opinions vary about Bathsheba. They say, well, what kind of a woman would take a bath on a roof? Well, it was common in those days. That was a logical place. She didn't know the king was going to be home, right? Some people say that Bathsheba seduced the king. I don't believe so. I believe Bathsheba didn't have much of a choice when called by the king. And so she came. I think Bathsheba was afraid for her life. And so she unwillingly submitted to the king's sinful wishes. But imagine this. Imagine being taken advantage of by someone in power while your husband's away. Imagine all of a sudden having an unplanned pregnancy that you have to deal with. Imagine now having to move away from your home, having experienced the death of your husband and become a part of this king's palace. And you're not just one wife, you're one of many wives. And then imagine because of David's sin, having the child that you bear die. Think about Bathsheba and how David's sin affected her. She was a victim. Another reason I believe that is because even in that horrible situation, God in his great grace saw Bathsheba and blessed her with another child named Solomon who would become an even greater king in Israel 
and who would sit on the throne and build the temple where God would be worshipped, and who through one day where Jesus would be born in his lineage. Did you know that Bathsheba is listed in the lineage of Jesus Christ? I think God was in his great grace and love for Bathsheba, said, I'm going to include you in my plan. I know this wasn't your plan, but I'm going to include you in my plan. And do you know how she's listed? Not as Bathsheba, wife of David. It's the wife of Uriah, the Hittite. The man she really loved. Just a thought. But David's sin affected so many people. And I want to take just a moment to address an issue this morning that has faced our Southern Baptist Convention in recent days. Because of an increasing concern with the denomination alleging the mishandling of sexual abuse and misconduct by those in authority, a majority of the messengers last year voted to allow a secular third-party organization called Guidepost to conduct a thorough investigation into claims dating back to the last 20 years. And the results of the report revealed some disturbing information that some of you know about and some of you do not. But the results of the report sent just ripples of shame and repentance throughout the Southern Baptist churches. Instances where victims of sexual abuse were discredited or ignored, even an instant where a prominent leader in a denomination had fallen into sexual sin without consequence. And every time something like this happens, I am reminded just how fragile we are. That even the best of men, as I said, are men at best. I'm also reminded how careful we must be in protecting the vulnerable. And by the way, we are all vulnerable to temptation. And so as your pastor, I wanted to take this opportunity to say that I am personally committed to avoiding even the perception of impurity in my own life. You say, well, don't you trust yourself? No, I do not. I do not trust myself. And so I put in place many layers of accountability. So if there's ever an accusation, I have two or three people that say, well, that can't be, and here's why. And so I put those barriers in my life. The other ministers and I and our staff will not be alone with a person of the opposite sex that is not our spouse. We just don't do it. We're not alone with a person of the opposite sex. Not only is it not practiced, it is also not permitted by our written policy as a church. It's in writing. Our office doors have windows. Those doors are usually open. And and I have to say this, and and just hear me as I say this in love. If you are a lady in in our church, and you are stranded on the side of of, of the road in a torrential downpour, and I drive by, I will not stop and pick you up and give you a ride. I will wave at you, and I will call and have someone come and get you. But I will not pick you up because I don't ride in a car alone with a woman who's not my wife. See, that's extreme, I know. But it's worth it to me. Let me also say that Hopewell is not a soft target for anyone who wishes to harm us physically or those who would wish to abuse others sexually. We have taken extreme security measures. They're in place here at Hopewell to make it the safest place we know how for you and your children. Anyone who works with our students, anyone who works in our children's ministry, go through an extensive background check, not only just to check and see what they may have done, but then we interview at least three personal references And then we reserve the right to deny you access on top of that. Security cameras are strategically placed all over the building, and they're always recording. You're always being watched. And by the way, we know that when seconds count, police are minutes away, so we have a diligent security team every time we meet. And while you come to worship and focus on the Lord, they're focused on everything else. They're even watching me right now. We will also take any accusation of sexual abuse or misconduct seriously. We will investigate it thoroughly. And we are mandatory reporters of child abuse and neglect. And we will inform the appropriate authorities when either of those things is detected. 
Listen, guys, Satan walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And we have to be diligent in resisting him. We need to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. And so I just wanted to make that assurance to you today. And also, I wanted to let you know that we will continue to partner with the Southern Baptist Convention of Churches as we strive to evangelize the world for the glory of God. And we are trusting that the current leadership of the executive committee will make necessary changes to protect both victims of abuse and our affiliated churches from those who would harm them. Our mission has not changed, and our partnership remains valid. And we know this. What we cover from God, he will uncover. Right? But the other side of that's true. What we uncover to God, he will cover. You know the rest of David's story? David and Bathsheba, still blinded by his sin, God sends Nathan the prophet to tell David of a man who took something that didn't belong to him. And he was infuriated. Who is this man? This man deserves the harshest punishment. And Nathan said, thou art the man. And what did David do? Did David have Nathan killed? Did David change the rules to fit his sin? No. He was broken before God. God convicted him of sin. He responded to that conviction in outright repentance and in sorrow for his sin. He was broken and he wept and there were consequences. David and Bathsheba's son died. There were consequences, but he found forgiveness. Part of the consequence was that the sword would not depart from David's family. And David wrote a song, Psalm 51, about the convicting power of God on his life and how he was broken and how he sorrowed over his sin. And even in judgment, God was gracious. And he allowed Solomon to be born of Bathsheba, who would go on to be the greatest king that Israel had ever known. But Solomon wasn't David's only son who felt the result of David's sins. And so... As we continue, I want you to also consider briefly number three, David's sons, his sons, his songs, his sins, his sons. Solomon was the most famous son of David, but he has some infamous sons as well. Amnon and Absalom. When you read David's story from 2 Samuel 13 through 18, and when you read about David's home life, you see the fruits of a faulty father. He made plenty of mistakes. David's son Amnon has an unnatural affection for his sister, and he rapes Tamar, his sister. And because David passively ignores what happened, and he doesn't do anything to Amnon, Absalom avenges his sister by killing his own brother. And then David, even though he's in sorrow for what's going on, even though he knows his family's in shambles, he doesn't step up and lead like a mighty king. He passively sits by, And watches Absalom, filled with resentment, bitterness, and rage, begin to pull people out of David's kingdom and gain and form some alliances. And he pushes David out of Jerusalem. His own son supplants his authority, supplants his rule. And David is forced to leave with his tail between his legs in fear of his own son, Absalom. His family's a mess. And I can't tell you how many times I see this over and over again successful men at work, successful men in industry who completely neglect their family. They're winning at work. They're winning in the world. They have great respect, great leadership. They're advancing, but their family is a shambles because they stand by passively. They're not engaged. Their kids barely know them. David was a detached dad. And while he may have been a powerful king, he was a pitiful father. Pitiful father. You know, there's a generation of preachers that told the other generation that followed them, you know what? Just take care of the church and God will take care of your family. Put the church first and God will take care of your family. Burn yourself out for Jesus and the people, and your family will be just fine. What they didn't tell them 
is that if you lose your family, you lose your ministry. And I see it over and over again. I say with no regret, no qualification, that the order of the relationships in my life are Jesus first, my family second, and his church third. Did you hear what I said? It's his church. It's not my church. Jesus, my family, his church, that's the order, without apology. I have my faults as a father, but at the end of the day, I want my kids to know two things. I love Jesus, and I love them. That's it. David was a faulty father. He made mistakes. But before you write David off completely, we need to remember what God said about him in Acts 13. Do you remember? What did God say about this man, David? That he was a man after God's own heart. Are you serious? How can that be said of David? Well, it comes in, number four. We need to remember his salvation. In the life of King David, we see the magnanimous mercy of God demonstrated time and time again. He found grace in the eyes of God. Through it all, through his transgression with Bathsheba, the arranged death of Uriah, his prideful numbering of the people of Israel, his pitiful parenting, which would cause him years and years of heartache. In all of these transgressions, David cast himself on the mercy and grace of God. He knew he needed it in him, and he was spared. After being confronted by Nathan about Bathsheba, David prayed from Psalm 51, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. He cast himself on the mercy and grace of God. After being confronted by the prophet Gad for the sin of numbering God's people, David said, I am in great distress. Please let me fall into the hands of the Lord, for his mercies are great. David knew that while God was all-powerful, just, and would certainly judge him for his sin, he also knew that God was merciful. And he needed God's mercy. One of the church fathers, Brother Lawrence, in his book, The Practice of the Presence of God, writes this, I regard myself as the most wretched of all men, stinking and covered with sores, as the one who has committed all sorts of crimes against his king. Overcome by remorse, I confess all my wickedness to him, ask his pardon, and abandon myself entirely to him to do with as he will. That's genuine repentance. But then he writes, but this king... Filled with goodness and mercy, far from chastising me, lovingly embraces me, makes me eat at his table, serves me with his own hands, gives me the keys of his treasure, and treats me as his favorite. That's God's mercy. He talks with me. He's delighted with me in a thousand and one ways. He forgives me and relieves me of my principal bad habits without talking about them. I beg him to make me according to his heart and always more weak and despicable. I see myself to be then the more beloved I am of God. We come to God and we say, I'm a sinner. I deserve judgment. I deserve justice. And God says, I know. But I gave my son for you. He took your sin so that I could give you mercy and love. And he welcomes us as his own. That's the God we serve. That's the God that David served. So what made this faulty father David a man after God's own heart? It was his readiness to throw himself in repentance upon the mercy of God. His willingness to admit, I am a sinful man. I need God's grace and mercy. He didn't try to justify himself. He didn't try to excuse himself. He genuinely and completely repented and asked God for mercy. He said in Psalm 51, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. And God did. God did. David knew that God's mercy was unmerited, unmatched, and immeasurable. 
There's a great song entitled, His Mercy is More. And one of the verses is, What patience would wait as we constantly roam. What father so tender is calling us home. He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. His mercy is more. God gives grace to all faulty fathers. Will you stand with me, please, this morning? As our musicians come and we prepare to enter into a time of prayer, I want to challenge those of you who especially who are fathers this morning. And I want to say to you, I'm a faulty father, and so are you. So are you. But the good news is, is that we have a gracious God. And He stands ready to forgive. He stands ready to empower you, to help you. All you have to do is ask. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask from God who will give it. He'll give it today. If you're on the edge of making a sinful decision, may I say in the name of Jesus Christ, don't do it. Stop now in the name of Jesus. You have no idea the pain and heartache that is on the other side of that sinful choice. Turn. Turn while you can. Maybe you've already made the mistake. The plea is the same. Turn. Turn away from your sin and trust in Jesus. You will find mercy at the foot of the cross. But you need to come clean. You keep trying to cover it up, God's going to uncover it. But God's word promises that anything we uncover, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Today could be a new beginning for you. So if you need to come and you need to pray, we're not going to presume that you're in sexual sin. If you come to pray, the altars are open. We're just saying, if you need to pray and if you admit, I'm a faulty father, God, I need your help. Will you help me? Will you help me honor you with my life? Will you help me lead my family? Will you help me love my wife? Will you help me leave a legacy? I want to be a man after your own heart today. If you need to pray, the altars are open. If you're here this morning, you don't know Jesus as your Savior. The plea is the same. Turn from your sin and trust in Jesus who is able to save you. God loved you so much he gave his, his only son to die in your place, to take your sin upon himself to pay the price for your, for your sins so that you can have a relationship with him. To prove that he could save you, he died. He defeated your, your worst enemy. And then he rose from the dead, showing that he has the power to save. Trust him today for your salvation. There's pastors here that will show you from God's word how you can be saved. But let's do business with God this morning. Let's pray for our sister churches in the Southern Baptist Convention. Let's pray for our leaders that God will give them wisdom and discernment and compassion. God is using Southern Baptists to reach the world with the gospel. The devil doesn't like that. But we, we have the victory through Jesus. We just need to turn to him and trust in him. So I challenge you, let's do business with God this morning. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for David. We thank you that even though in many ways he's a poor example, in one way he is an outstanding example and that he throws himself on your mercy and grace. Help us to do the same this morning. Lord, we need you. We're a broken people who stand in need of grace. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come and do business with the Lord today.